moderate this panel, and then I apologize that I'm going to have to run off because I have a class to go teach. I see at least one of my students in the audience who probably will have to do the same. Um, but so to give us as much time as possible to have a conversation, I'm going to turn the floor over right now to Ivan. Um, <coughs> thank you, Jeffrey, for, for this kind uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor for me always to, to visit CSIS. Uh, and to be with this wonderful team of the Russia and Eurasia uh, program. I look forward to uh, an interesting discussion and, uh, and Olga's criticism <laughs> 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 who always <laughs> helps me to sharpen <laughs> uh, uh, arguments. Um, <clears throat> and that would be in particular available because uh, my argument is uh, uh, is still in, in, in the process of, uh, uh, of being fully shaped. I am arguing, um, and I am working on the topic, that the perception in Central Asia of their, of their policies vis-a-vis -vis other states and their perception of what is balance, geopolitical balance, political balance between great powers, their perception of this uh, has been shifting uh, for a while, for, for a few years. And right now, this shift goes that far that this may have already political consequences and, and, and may change their, uh, their policies. To better introduce this, uh, this argument, um, I, I go a little bit into, into the history, how their policies were, were developing. In the 90s, uh, this wa that was a very difficult decade for all post-Soviet states and uh, for Central Asia also. They were looking for international attention they, in, in very general terms. They not only needed uh, capital, investment, assistance, they, they needed a sort of recognition, <laughs> uh, international attention in very, very general terms. To put it bluntly, they wanted to be noticed on this political, uh, on this political map uh, because people were confusing their names, their locations, their politicians. So they, they wanted to be, uh, to be noticed and, uh, uh, and somehow uh, appreciated. Um, that, that was going for a while. Um, and who knows what would be the end result of their advertising and marketing, if not the 9-11. The 9-11 was the game changer for, uh, for the region because the United States, uh, the U.S. interest in the region uh, increased dramatically. And Central Asians, uh, to some extent, un unexpectedly for themselves, found themselves to be in a sort of center <laughs> if not epicenter of, of the regional politics, and even more, uh, more globally in the, in the center of the global uh, politics. The United States paid attention to them, and uh, the assistance of the, United, uh, of the United States to all Central Asian countries skyrocketed between 2001 and 2004. It was not like thousands of percents. Uh, the assistance increased three, four, five times uh, over, over a few years. A lot of delegations uh, started uh, going, uh, a lot of practical cooperation between secret services, between the military, uh, and so on and so on. Um, of course, uh, Russia was tr also trying to, uh, to be more present in Central Asia, not just to let the, the region uh, be in fully under the influence of the United States. Chinese interest in the region was also growing. China was getting more and more access to uh, various commodities, uh, to local industries. Trade was, uh, was going on. And, and regional countries also uh, wanted to engage Central Asians more and more. Japan, Turkey, Iran, Gulf countries, uh, then of course uh, the European interest to Central Asia uh, grew up. So Central Asians 
suddenly found out that everyone needed them. Uh, they could confuse the purpose uh, why everyone needed them, but they, didn't, they definitely finally had uh, international interest. And very quickly they developed the concept that they can profit from this, int uh, from this interest. Um, and that's why the understanding of the, uh, of the geopolitical balance was like playing between all these uh, international, global, and regional actors. Um, they actually, Central Asians actually liked competition uh, in the region because the, the very common thinking, and that is common wisdom, if people are competing over you, you can get uh, something of, uh, of that. Although, bluntly, you are just uh, an object of competition, still you have a voice, you can uh, say yes to, to one or another <laughs> competing uh, friend and, uh, and get some profit from that. Uh, investment, assistance, uh, preferences with uh, trade, uh, even bribes, that's, that's also a benefit. Um, and that's why they were trying, actually they were not afraid of competition. Central Asians were happy with the competition growing in the region because they thought that they can benefit from, uh, from this competition. The only risk which was uh, apprehended and which was uh, quite important for the governments of the region, that was the risk that those who are competing, uh, who are competing over you may deal not only with the government in, in office, but also with their position. Uh, and that's why if uh, you dissatisfy some of powerful international partners, they may support uh, internal challenges, uh, internal opposition, and, and so on. Um, all, this all this risk was summarized in the metaphor of the colored revolution when international partners may prefer not to deal with you, but to substitute your government with, uh, with their position. However, that risk was very important, and uh, in the previous decade, uh, all the region was uh, discussing this threat of the colored revolution, how big it was. Many thought that actually Russia was manipulating the threat of the colored uh, revolution and, uh, and exaggerating it. However, uh, many uh, governments did, uh, did have concerns about, uh, about what, what is uh, summarized as, uh, as colored revolutions. But that risk seemed acceptable. So you need to be, <coughs> to be smart when you deal with international partners. And if you are smart enough, then they do not go to your position. They, they work, uh, with, they work with, uh, with you. However, soon, by the late uh, decade, by the late previous decade, another risk surfaced, which nobody predicted uh, initially, and which turned out to be far more important than the risk of colored revolution. That was the risk that actually international players may, uh, may prefer to get rid of the leader <laughs> rather than to deal with the leader, not because that benefits their interest, but because they do not want to play the, re the, the, the game uh, of, the regional, uh, of the regional competition. Um, the first example of that uh, sort is the example of Bakiev, who was playing the geopolitical competition between Russia and the United States so actively that he was actually pushing both Russia and the United States to more competition than these countries wanted. Of course, there was a competition over, over Kyrgyzstan, no, no question about it. But Bakiev wanted to, to intensify that competition, and he was playing that game so aggressively that finally both Russia and the United States uh, 
decided that they do not need to play this, this intensive uh, geopolitical competition as Bakiev wanted us to, uh, to play. And in the end of his presidency, Bakiev didn't have confidence neither in Washington nor in Moscow. And actually, Moscow and Washington, although already in quite intensive competition in many parts of the, po of the post-Soviet uh, space, in Kyrgyzstan, we both were happy <laughs> with Bakiev losing power and the power going to, uh, to, the, new, uh, to the new government. Uh, another example of that sort was, uh, was Saakashvili, whose, uh, whose regional game in the Caucasus was also so intensive that Russia in the, and, and the United States did not want to go to, uh, to, those, uh, to those extremes. And in the end of his uh, presidency, also Saakashvili had very low profile both in Washington and uh, uh, and in Moscow. And there was a sort of an undeclared compromise that he should leave <laughs> and, there is a, uh, and there should be a, a new page in the, uh, in the, in the regional uh, politics. And the last example of that sort was, uh, was Yanukovych, who uh, faced a little bit different dilemma by that time, already uh, Russia and the, uh, and the European Union and the United States uh, pushed their competition further, and they wanted Yanukovych to make a sort of ultimate cho choice, which side uh, in the regional competition he chooses. And Yanukovych failed to make, uh, to make a clear choice, and also lost his, uh, his power. So all these examples demonstrate that actually intensive competition may, may not only bring benefits, but may be very dangerous for your internal stability and, and for your presidency. <coughs> In particular, the case of, uh, of Ukraine was very, very important. So it was a sort of growing uh, cautionness uh, in the in the in the post uh, Soviet capitals, first with uh, Bakiev, then with Saakashvili, and then uh, Yanukovych's experience, it was already like an alarm. Um, so it turned out that instead of getting benefits from intensive competition between great powers, you may have a lot of difficulties inside your country, up to losing power and even escaping your country, not being able. <laughs> Uh, not being able to, uh, to return. And that was a sort of challenge to this common wisdom that you can benefit from, uh, from competition. And that was the challenge to the two uh, different models of the multipolarity uh, policy or multivectoral policy. Uh, one model is the multivectoral policy of Kazakhstan, and another model is multivectoral policy of Uzbekistan. The difference is that Kazakhstan usually tries to make all partners happy. So if Kazakhstan uh, intensifies relations uh, with the United States, they also uh, do something more with Russia. Uh, of course, not in equal uh, proportions, but still, it's like uh, playing uh, all the same game with, uh, with all partners, but in different proportions. Like you pay 80% uh, of attention to the United States, but still you increase a little bit your cooperation with Russia as well, so that Russia does not complain, and, uh, and the other way. While the Kazakh model was changing partners, <coughs> so they were either preference changing partners. The Uzbek model. The Uzbek model. Yeah, sorry. The Uzbek model was changing partners. First, you do <coughs> with one partner, and then you, when when you exhaust his patience and uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> and your expectation for benefits. Uh, 
reaches the limits, you do not get what, what you expect, and then you change the partner and you play all the same, uh, all the same game. So these are a little bit different models of multivectoral policy, but both these models were changed with the, new, uh, with the uh, understanding of this new risk that playing intensive, uh, playing between great powers too intensively, you may lose uh, your power. And from 2014, 2015, we can see that Central Asian governments take steps to deliver the message both to the United States and to Russia that please do not proliferate your tension and your competition to our region. Uh, we do not want to be object of your competition. You may compete somewhere in Syria, if you wish, in, in Africa, in Latin America, but <coughs> please do not proliferate your tension uh, into, into Central Asian uh, region. And this is very different from, the, from what they thought 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, they wanted uh, us to compete so that they get benefits from this competition. But now they want us not to push them, not to engage them into our, uh, into our competition. Uh, this can be summarized in different terms. Sometimes uh, this is called <coughs> uh, de-politization de uh, of the regional politics or de-geopolitization uh, of the regional uh, of the regional politics. Um, we should say that the most high, uh, the m uh, most of the expectations for tension proliferation into Central Asia, these expectations did not materialize. Russia and the United States are not in very active competition right now in, uh, in Central Asia. Many people expected after Ukraine that, that we would <laughs> compete more in the post-Soviet uh, space. At least that was the expectation in Central Asia, and they were afraid of such, or concerned with such, uh, with such expectation. Um, and it seemed for Central Asian governments that everything is fine. Tension does not proliferate into, into their region. Uh, they have a sort of pause in the geopolitical uh, competition and they can uh, think of how to continue economic projects, but without intensive geopolitical competition. However, with the Trump administration <coughs> being very uh, tough on partners, <laughs> even on close partners of the United States, and ignorant on many other partners uh, or former partners of the United States, uh, the region of the Trump administration in Central Asia produced the concern that actually Central Asia may be overlooked again. Um, of course, that does not mean that all partners will forget about Central Asia, but we see how the European interest in Central Asia uh, shrinked from very, very uh, big scale interest 10 years ago when their strategy was introduced to just a few pragmatic and a few value-based uh, projects which, uh, which European Union continues, uh, continues in, the, in the region. We see that <coughs> uh, Iran, the Gulf countries, and Turkey, although they continue their policy uh, in the region, um, they are also not delivering that much to the region as the region, uh, as the region expected. So this realization that Central Asia may be marginalized again <laughs> after being for a decade at the center of the, of the politics, at the center of, uh, of the news and all the, all the and, and many discussions, you suddenly find out that you have only marginal interest of all, of all major, uh, major players. 
Even the Chinese interest in Central Asia, whatever important is the Silk Road, most of this modern Silk Road is not about Central Asia, but about other global routes to connect Central Asia to the Middle East and, uh, uh, and to Europe. So Central Asia was a sort of downgraded uh, in the policies of all major players. And one could think that this should be a good message for the Central Asian governments. They wanted to downgrade competition. You get it. Nobody is that much interested in, uh, in you anymore. However, suddenly this uh, was not well received. And Central Asians are concerned that they may lose international attention again, just like they were concerned in the 90s. And the thinking in Central Asia is how to maintain international attention, but not to have geopolitical competition on the territory of Central Asia as a component of that, mm -hmm. of that attention. This may become a very important and uh, difficult dilemma for the Central Asian governments. Because we see that those who maintain interest in Central Asia, and that is, first of all, Russia and, and China, make this interest more and more pragmatic and make their policies more and more conditioned. Uh, there is still assistance. There is still unconditioned assistance. But the Chinese Silk Road project on, on Central Asia, although it is phrased in many, many good words, it's a very pragmatic uh, project for Central Asia. A Russian project for Central Asia with the Eurasian Economic Union is also very pragmatic. And Central Asians feel that they do not have much political, much room for political maneuver. They need to take maybe not political decisions, but very important technical decisions and uh, integrate into the economic zones of, of either China or, or Russia. And this shrinking of the opportunities and choices, the shrinking of the room for political maneuvering is a very big problem and bad news for Central Asian governments. And they think how this can be extended again. Um, and, one, and, and that is the final point I'm making, and this, is, uh, and this is the key argument, that the new dilemma is emerging for, uh, for Central Asia. How to re-engage international attention, but without the component of geopolitical competition. And all this in the situation when we see that big players politicize politicize economic projects and economize political projects. Political or geopolitical and economic issues become very, very interconnected, much more interconnected than it was uh, in the last 20, 25 years after, after the end of the, Cold, uh, of the Cold War. And because of this reality of interconnection between political, geopolitical, and economic uh, issues, because of politicization of economical issues and economization of political issues, to have attention of big international players without geopolitical component, without their geopolitical competition, may be an un unresolvable <laughs> uh, dilemma. Um, and, and that will be a very bad news for, for Central Asian countries. The immediate answer which we see uh, the Central Asian uh, countries are trying to do is finally to establish a sort of regional organization, regional meaning only for the five Central Asian countries without uh, regional or global uh, outsiders. Uh, Kazakhstan is already f officially pushing for, for, for this idea. And maybe this regional organization will be finally, uh, finally established. However, this, of course, will help to market the region as 
an asset in the international politics, but the dilemma of how to attract attention without geopolitical competition will still be, uh, will still be in place. Here I stop, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, let's give the floor <coughs> over to Olya now to uh, provide her observations and comments. So I thought this was really interesting. I'm, I'm always, um, you know, I think one of the tremendous advantages we get um, from interactions with <coughs> scholars who study these things from different perspectives is the extent to which you can learn from viewpoints that are um, that are different from your own, just both in the description, Ivan's description of how the Central Asians <coughs> were looking at this competition. Something that really, really struck me is um, this, um, when, when you're looking for a benefit from the competition, right? You think if, you, if you're a country, wherever a stand, and you think, okay, people are interested in me, I want them to compete. Are you thinking people are interested in me and I want them to compete because there's going to be a benefit to my country? Or are you thinking I'm, they're interested in me, I want them to compete because there's going to be a benefit to me personally? Because the cost you're talking about are costs to them personally, right? It's that the danger is a danger of regime change. Now, you could argue that the fear is of instability, but we're not really talking about instability, right? We're talking about individual <coughs> human beings. And the other thing that's interesting about this, I don't know how this gets looked at at the Kremlin and at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I do know how in the 90s and 2000s it was looked at here in Washington, the State Department and the Pentagon. And this notion of well, we're sick of that guy, he's putting us into a difficult situation, we're going to try to undermine his government, is not a thing that actually crossed people's minds. I mean, maybe it crossed somebody's mind here and there, but it was not policy, and it was not what policy was geared for. If anything, what happens is familiarity breeds more programs and more attention, so you pay more you, you notice more when um, there's less democratic actions, you notice you, you send more observers to the elections, you complain more if the elections are irregular. Um, if you're giving them money, you worry about how the money is being spent in a way that you don't if you're not giving them money. But when personalization happens, it's more along the lines of what happened in Georgia with Saakashvili, or I would say in Ukraine with Yushchenko, where okay, we like this guy. W what happens if he goes away? What if they do have an election and get rid of him? That could be bad. That would be bad. Okay, well, that would be bad. We have to make friends with more people. We need to know more people so that we have a better sense of it. But it's, um, and there's concern, but it's not, I mean, I, I can understand a perception that there's a shoring up of individuals, but that's very rarely how American policymakers think of it. Um, and in terms of getting rid of individuals, that's almost never how they think of it. Uh, with the possible exception of Shevardnadze at the end of the Rose Revolution where everybody, <coughs> including the Georgians, was pretty convinced that it was time for him to go. Um, and Russians as well that time. Well, exactly. No, I mean, the, but the, you know, the United States wasn't going to do anything about it, right? The Russians were the ones who flew out to try to, to explain to him that, uh, you know, maybe it was time. So it's, um, you know, I think this is really interesting because I think in the United States, we miss the extent to which it's personalized in other countries, and not just in Central Asia, not just in post-Soviet countries. We miss the extent to which people think the United States is their friend personally, not their country's friend. That we miss the extent to which they see support as being political in, in their domestic political context. And I, and I think that's, um, for American policymakers and American researchers, I think that's, that's a fairly important insight. For Russians and Central Asians, uh, and Ukrainians and Georgians and everybody else, I would encourage a certain understanding of the U.S. blindness to all of this, um, which, um, while I might suggest that we understand it, people like me might try to understand it. Uh, the folks down the street are still going to have a lot on their plates, <coughs> so it's going to be a very minor component. I also am struck by you mentioned value-based EU projects, but you don't—you didn't mention value-based EU projects as a regime change, color revolution project. That's just things that the EU does. 
And I would argue the United States and the EU actually view their value-based projects fairly similarly, that we do good things because they'll be good for you, right? <laughs> we, we think it's good for these countries to have um, a vibrant <clears throat> civil society. We think that free market economies are good. We think that free speech is good. We want to help, right? I mean, we, do, we don't do it because we want to de destabilize polities, even though sometimes it can help destabilize polities. We don't do it because we're trying to overthrow a single leader or group of leaders. We do it because these are the things we do, and that's the priority, and we do them all over the world, and you know, this is kind of our checklist of all of the things that we're gonna do. So it's interesting but that also when the EU does it, perhaps it is viewed a little um, less um, as a hostile action than when the United States does it, which I think is another, another piece of this dynamic. Um, I also wonder, when you say that interest is downgraded, is it really downgraded for Russia? And because the um, Eurasian Economic Union may, may be pragmatic, but it doesn't make a ton of economic sense. It makes mostly political sense for Russia. It's a way of kind of keeping these countries together. Um, and I feel that Russia has always been the country that cared the most, and it continues to be the country that cares the most. Uh, I don't know if that's good for the countries of Central Asia or not, but um, you know, it, it's, it is a reality for the countries of Central Asia. Whatever attention you get from the Chinese and the Americans, at least in the near term, is going to be fleeting. The Chinese, if their economic interests really do develop, they, that might translate into something a little more lasting. But kind of for the time being, you don't, you don't really see that. Um, and um, I guess two more things that I, I well, three things that I would uh, throw out. One is, um, so are the Russians and the Chinese being pragmatic, or are they, or is it still about geopolitics? Um, and are the Central Asian states, when they look to them, are they being pragmatic? We're just going to try to get as many resources as we want, or, you know, if you want attention, I mean, Kazakhstan's done a good job of getting attention. Um, without, I mean, that's that is the, the Kazakh model as you described it that it's about, we, you know, we're staying on good terms with everybody. And it sends signals to the other countries. It sends the signal that, no, we don't actually want to be a pawn in your fight. It is the opposite of the signal that sometimes was received from both Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan of we're, we're willing to you know, sell to the highest bidder for as long as the, the, as the bidding's high. The Kazakhs are like, no, no, no. We want good relations with everybody. And then you saw Kyrgyzstan certainly has tended in that direction with a few blips. I don't know what um, the Uzbek model will be going forward. I think that's actually a very interesting question with a new government in Uzbekistan and potentially a lot of changes, which interestingly, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about these changes is, I mean, they can't be trying to court the United States with this because it's not as though the Trump administration has shown any signs of caring what you do with your political prisoners. So is Uzbekistan liberalizing to the extent that it's liberalizing for? Because it also buys into that these things are good model, which you know I certainly buy it, but um, which which is good, in, you know, from the perspective of it might allow for more freedom, uh, economic and political for its people. But it's it's an interesting question, and how does that play into Russian attitudes and Chinese attitudes, particularly if the United States doesn't play a role? So, if the United States is pushing for various changes and the country's making them, they can be seen as foreign influence. The United States isn't pushing and the country's making those changes. Are the Russians going to be more comfortable with it? I, you know, I strongly suspect the Chinese don't care. Um, and then finally, Afghanistan. You've written a lot about Afghanistan, but we haven't talked about Afghanistan. Um, what are the implications of what we probably expect to be continued unrest, but at a low level for the foreseeable future? on how Central Asian countries view their role in competition, concord, whatever else may be emerging. Okay, great. Um, we have a fair bit of time uh, for questions. Uh, as I said, I'm going to have to duck out, so I think if you're I'll, okay with I'll, it, I will allow Olya to moderate <coughs> the rest of this, but I want to thank you all again for coming, and I hope you have uh, interesting and, and insightful things to say. I'm sure they will. Okay. So, shall we? Do you, do you want to respond and then we can open it up? Uh, yeah, slowly? just for, uh, to, to a couple of points. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's not an easy question 
what is the balance between pragmatism and geopolitics in Russian and Chinese attitudes to, uh, to Central Asia. Um, both Russia and China try to shape their policies as being overwhelmingly pragmatic. Sure. But everyone suspects that there is something mm -hmm. behind this pragmatism, <laughs> some political agenda, some expectation for political loyalty. When you say pragmatic, you, you mean economic interests? Is that how you? Yes, I mean, first of all, economic, mm -hmm. uh, economic projects. But there is still a, an understanding that if we have a lot of economic pro uh, projects, probably you do not vote against me in the General Assembly. <laughs> or you do not raise your uh, voice against me when I have controversies uh, in some regions or global, global affairs. Which is an understanding it's harder to get with the United States and the European Union. Uh, yes, but to which level this political, so what, what, what to, wi to what extent the, should be this political loyalty, there are no rules for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why there may be mismatch of uh, the expectation between, the, between Russia and China, what they uh, expect from, from their regional partners, and the expectation of the regional partners, what actually they owe right. to, to these uh, bigger partners. Um, and this mismatch, uh, can be found out only on the practical level when there is some controversy and then mm -hmm. diplomats meet and suddenly regional countries find out that they owe more than <laughs> they, they thought they, uh, they, they do. Um, and I think that it may happen in this way that, uh, that regional countries will uh, find out over years and years that they owe more <laughs> morally and politically than than they expected. And actually nobody told them <laughs> how much they, uh, they owe. I don't think this is going to be a very big political problem, but um, it means that economic cooperation becomes not exactly conditioned because there is no, uh, no presented condition, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it becomes more and more unofficially politically tied to some very generally understood loyalty. Um, and then how this generally understood loyalty will be translated in, uh, in concrete issues, we, we will see. <laughs> it will be discovery and it will be political game for, for everyone, for regional governments and also for Russia and, uh, and China. But I do think that there is that uh, political, geopolitical component be behind uh, pragmatic, uh, okay. pragmatic projects. And one follow on on that, so kind of coming back to the first point, is the punishment or the reward personal or national? So it, <coughs> is it, who, who has to be loyal, the individual or the country? Um, yeah, of course, it's, it's personal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's mostly about individual, although over years, it's not individual narrowly understood as just one person. It's, it's more broadly understood as uh, the core of the political, uh, of the political elite. Um, however, when you said that the United States did not realize how uh, important personal issues are, I think that there was enough time to realize it. Oh, sure. <laughs> because I think the Kazakh diplomacy was officially and unofficially very uh, good in delivering the message that Kazakh gate was to much extent a, a personal issue. Uh, all that uh, story with the arrest of uh, Griffin and, uh, or, and all the, the worries for, for the Kazakh political elite and, and the inner circle of, uh, of President right. Nazarbayev. And it still didn't get through. 
I, well, I think it's, 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 it's mostly resolved. <laughs> it, no, the, the situation resolved, but I don't think it's resolved because the Cossacks got through the message that it's all personal. Um, and I don't think that, and I think you're absolutely right, the United States should have, over all this time of working with the Central Asians, um, figured this out, and not just in Central Asia, really all over the world. But the United States, in part because of the way our system works, and the reason that, the fact that people transition in and out of government roles, so everybody rediscovers every part of the world every few years and says, oh my god, this is fascinating, there are countries here, we have relationships with them, who knew? Um, it, it keeps that learning from happening. That's true. All right, let's, let's open it up and let's let other people join into this discussion. So, um, yeah. yes, please. Everybody is. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a microphone coming. And yes, you, you did identify, do what this gentleman does. Identify yourself and then do ask a question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I have one question about Kazakhstan. Ah, okay. Uh, so you talk about a lot about Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan is a big nation. Uh, I'm from Georgia and I know a little bit about that region and also from my region, but uh, and now it's main question there is what, uh, what after another bias. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas uh, about U.S. policy regarding this issue? What else? U.S. policy? Yeah, because now it seems that uh, China already replaced U.S. there, but still, <laughs> it's a big country. I think U.S. policy on Kazakhstan after Nazarbayev as we look forward to having our energy companies do business with the energy companies of Kazakhstan. And, you know, we will, I, I, I don't think the United States has a particular policy, but I think the expectation is that there will be a transition of some sort. Um, it will probably, we hope, be peaceful and calm and quiet and we'll go along with it. I think that's as, as much U.S. policy as you're going to get. Um, what's Russia's policy? Um, I, I think that many people underestimate how close Russian and Kazakh elites are. If you take uh, people from high places of Russia and, and Kazakhstan, uh, big businessmen, ministers, and, uh, and all their entourage, the uh, Russian and Kazakh elites to much extent live the same life. <laughs> they go to the same resorts, uh, they interact uh, in many, many different places of, uh, of the world. And these interconnections in, uh, in the elite, uh, they, they should be taken into, into account. That, that stabilizes government, government to government, uh, government to government relations very very much because they meet not only in offices, <laughs> but they meet uh, at uh, birthday, birthdays of friends, they meet at resorts, they meet uh, where their wives go somewhere, they, <laughs> they meet everywhere. Uh, so I cannot, I cannot say that this is just one elite, but, but the life of Russian and Kazakh elites, uh, their lives are very, very mixed. Uh, they earn money together and they spend money together. So what this means for <laughs> Kazakh transition is? <clears throat> I think it means that Russia is not very much worried about the Kazakh transition, which is not necessarily uh, the right thing not to worry. Um, I, I think there should be more, uh, more attention to, uh, to the options of the Kazakh of the transit in Kazakhstan and how it may go on. Because like in many other countries, in Kazakhstan, power and, uh, and money <laughs> are so much interconnected that uh, change of power may mean a lot to, to change of, of ownership uh, and control all the flows of, uh, uh, of money. Georgia also knows that. <laughs> um, however, right now, once again, because uh, all the Kazakh elite is well known in Russia, <laughs> and people are known just not as politicians, but as personalities, not just as businessmen, but as uh, friends and, uh, uh, and, and good friends. People do not worry, like, okay, who may come up so that we don't know him and he will do everything differently? Nobody, we know everyone. Um, I think that brings a lot of assurance that 
everything should be smooth and fine. Even if there are some uh, tensions inside the country, it does not mean much to, uh, to us. For us, business will continue as, as usual. Um, I, I understand this logic, but I would advise more uh, cautiousness. It may not necessarily go that, uh, that smooth. Look at, at, the, at the Uzbek example. Um, I don't, uh, we, we always were thinking about transit like keeping stability after the change of the president. We, we have stability in Uzbekistan so far. Um, the issue right now is not about stability as such. The issue is that the range of what is possible in Uzbekistan and in Uzbek foreign policy and economic policy extended so much that nobody ex ex expected anything like that. Uh, even probably the bureaucrats who are now in power <laughs> one year ago or two years ag ago did not expect that they would do what they do right now. And that is a very interesting question because <clears throat> uh, all the previous uh, authority in, uh, in Uzbekistan was always delivering the message that the policy on Uzbekistan uh, is, is very objective, meaning that the policy is determined by objective realities, mm -hmm. political, economic, social. The message from the previous Uzbek authorities was that, okay, maybe we're not nice, but we do not have many options <laughs> what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody would do more or less the same what we do. Then we have new authorities, but actually many people were in power, <laughs> were in the cabinet before, and we see that things may be done very, very differently. So how much is something what is going on objective, and how much depends on, on the personality? Uh, it looks like far more depends on the personality than they were, they, they were telling us. And that's why the range of what is possible is extended. And it may happen in, in other cases, not only in, uh, in Uzbekistan. And by the way, we, in the Uzbek case, it's still an open question, uh, you know, how far that change may, may go and all the, the economic uh, liberalization. Because some of the risks which the previous authorities were stressing, they are not uh, unrealistic. They are still uh, they they are still realistic. I do not, I cannot exclude scenarios when uh, security situation in Uzbekistan will deteriorate, and how will new authorities react? They will return to the previous course, or they will be able, or they will be willing to take higher security risks. Than the, previ than the previous authorities. We need, we need to see that. Uh, so far, what happens in Uzbekistan is, uh, is very interesting and very promising, but we will need to see how sustainable it is. Um, I think that some return to, to the previous model is not fully excluded. Yep, right here. Hi, uh, my name is Umida Hashimova. I'm in a personal capacity. Uh, at the end, you mentioned about the regional organization of the of Central Asian countries. <coughs> uh, but Central Asian countries did have a regional organization within the five countries, Central Asia Union, and uh, it was disbanded after economic Russia. Economic Union. Um, yeah, our economic Union. Russia entered as an as observer and became a member and disbanded. So then um, it became part, it merged into with Eurasia the Eurasian economic, economic with uh, Yevrazes that time. Yeah. So, but basically the, from five countries it went into uh, mm -hmm. five Central Asian countries and became Russia and other the countries. So I think um, basically the, the countries, they entered at that, uh, the point entered at the um, kind of regionalism fatigue kind of phase and they didn't want to be cut kind of regional countries and part of some kind of, in particular Uzbekistan, right? I mean, again, the biggest country in the, in the region. And, 
and they are not moving towards regional organization, and I, and I don't think they, they want it. I mean, uh, Kamilov, uh, Foreign Minister of Uzbekistan, just I think a couple of days ago, he said that they want to work with the countries, but they don't want to become a member of, 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 of any regional uh, organization. So I think it's kind of far future, and we shouldn't kind of see that the regional organization will become a panacea for kind of country, kind of solve the issue of the, of the region. I think they, they will work bilaterally, one on one, but I think we shouldn't kind of also put a bar into them. You should become a kind of part of some kind of regional organization. Response. Yeah, th this is very interesting uh, comment, and I would stress what you you say because I agree with that uh, with the very beginning of your uh, of your comment that Central Asian countries do not want to be regional. All Central Asian countries want it to be uh, maybe tiny but still global players. Turkmenistan was trying to emerge as. Uh, uh, as uh, an energy uh, supplier, of course, uncomparable to, to Saudi Arabia uh, or to Qatar, but still globally important, not just a, a, a tiny regional country. Kazakhstan was also dreaming about uh, being part, or, and, and continues to uh, continues this policy to become uh, member of, of this globalized uh, world uh, to enter what uh, the most competitive uh, states of, of the world and so on, economically competitive, technologically competitive. Uzbekistan also wanted to be a sort of uh, more or less globally important fabric. Of course, not like China, but also a globally important industrial country. Um, and Kazakhstan and Tajikistan were dreaming about becoming an important energy supplier from, uh, from hydro hydropower. Uh, so yes, nobody of them wanted to lock their future just in, uh, in the region. They were looking uh, outside. Uh, however, this stake on globalization uh, failed more or less in, uh, in all these cases. And the understand that there is a popular discussion in uh, in the post-Soviet space that actually all these countries, even Russia, <laughs> uh, have too small economies to be <coughs> to be globalized individually, <coughs> and there is a popular notion in our countries that. Uh, you, sh you, 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 you need to, <coughs> to globalize through a sort of regional organization, to, be, to join a, a, a big faction, some, to join some faction in globalization. <laughs> Not to globalize individually, <laughs> but through some regional, <coughs> regional mediation. And I think that this is an important element of the discussion on the future of the Eurasian Economic Union. Because for a while, Russia, Russia was trying to present it <coughs> Sorry. Let's collect some questions while uh, <laughs> all of on. Okay, Let, let's take three questions and uh, then uh, it's right up here. Anna Gusarova, uh, Central Asia Institute for Strategic Studies. Pleased to be here. Uh, actually, my question lies within the logic we were discussing about uh, which Central Asia does Russia want to have? 
I mean, as uh, being it's a stable region, unified, or being it a member of uh, either CSTO or Eurasian Economic Union. So it seems now that all the uh, political agenda and the political meetings going on within the region and with Russia as well is quite the logic of Russia pushing everyone to join these so, so, kind, so kind of uh, regional uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the ultimate goal of Russian pragmatism in the region? Okay, great. Um, all right. Yep. Emil Majidov uh, from <coughs> Azerbaijan. I'm here on Ramsfield Fellows Program together with some gentlemen. Um, um, I would comment on the <coughs> Russian pragmatic approach uh, um, sentiment. Um, I would rather uh, call it um, not a pragmatism, uh, because pragmatism would um, eventually and inevitably um, include a huge economic uh, trade and investment element. And uh, it seems it still is lacking very much in Russian attitude towards mm -hmm. the region, but rather as a consistency. Uh, I mean, uh, w w when you compare how Russia is dealing with its um, Central Asian and Caucasus uh, neighbors, you see much more consistency when compared uh, with um, the years of Yeltsin's administration or the, 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 the few following years. Uh, consistency is, is there, but um, uh, pragmatism uh, seems to be lacking very, um, uh, let's say, necessary elements. Uh, however, the, it, it is a sincere question from my side. Uh, maybe there is some uh, economic trade and investment policy that, for example, well, I'm not aware of and you could uh, tell us about. Right? Okay. Thanks. And let's take one more. <coughs> is there one more? <coughs> no? Okay, Ivan, do you feel... Okay. <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, Ali Koichmanov, I'm uh, 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 again a um, uh, Ramsfeld Fellow Wonderful. from Kazakhstan. And the question I want to ask Ivan is about the, well, uh, the, I mean, the role of Central Asia for, for, for big players. You mentioned that it's, I mean, it's been diminishing in the last years. I mean, like, about, uh, uh, do you actually kind of, I mean, you just uh, kind of, I mean, what are the underlying facts? Because if, 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 you, if you look from the first glance, the level of investments from big players, I mean, which like China, I mean, has been consistently and massively increasing uh, uh, investments from the Western world. To, like, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars into the projects, something like, while uh, kind of the, inf I mean, while the influence of Russia, I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, well, it, it, it's massive uh, politically, but economically, it has uh, been reducing. I mean, and moreover, if you if you if you think, I mean, like uh, uh, in kind of some of the um, uh, like actions taken, I mean, like the level of like Russian, like I think population in the region has been consistently um, uh, um, um, reducing, and uh, well, I mean, you probably heard about the recent uh, announcement that. The Kazakh <coughs> alphabet is going to be moved to um, uh, from Cyrillic to uh, to Latin. I mean, do you f f do you see this as a kind of <coughs> continuous reduction of the Russian influence in the region? Thank you. Okay, so we have three <coughs> Russia questions. So yeah, you saved Russia. you saved me from the American question. <coughs> <coughs> um, I will continue where I was interrupted, and, and I'm sorry for my coffin, uh, coffin that's <coughs> allergy, which, which I'm trying to, to fight. Um, there is a discussion right now on, on the Eurasian Economic Union on whether it is <coughs> a regional organization or a global organization. Because when, when it was emerging in uh, 2009, 2010, <coughs> the thinking was that globalization was stumbling, globalization was coming to an end, and the future is, the future of global economy is a combination or coexistence of big regional organizations. So, 
initially a sort of philosophy behind uh, this stage of integration, the Eurasian Union integration and, and the Customs Union integration, was that, and it coincided with the previous financial crisis, <coughs> was that regionalization is substitute for globalization. <coughs> and that's why the message was that we, we did not use the chance to integrate into globalization, so now we will do something regionally. <coughs> However, the interest in that uh, did not exist long, because already in 2000, 13 or 2014, I don't remember exactly, <coughs> one of the sessions of the St. Petersburg Economic Forum was re-globalization. Uh, so we were saying for a few years, like, globalization is nearly over. And then suddenly Russia said, no, 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 no. We see the new stage of regionalization, or of globalization. <coughs> so, however, this will be a globalization where the main players are regional, uh, are regionally integrated blocks. So they integrate, but do not isolate. They interact as integrated uh, economic blocks. And Russia said, and by the way, that thinking was very much provoked by, uh, by the US policy of building Trans-Atlantic uh, and Trans-Pacific economic <coughs> economic blocks. So Russia saw the future of uh, of blocks, and because we are not part of any of them, <laughs> neither <laughs> Trans-Pacific nor Trans-Atlantic nor EU, Russia decided to build to build its own block, uh, or to reinterpret the already existing uh, block into something not regionally isolated and self-sufficient, but as another regional uh, component to this global picture of globalization where the main players are regional blocks. And the efforts were shifted from building self-sufficient self -sufficient and majorly isolated economic block into <coughs> a block which will allow participating countries to be part of globalization. However, <coughs> both tendencies right now exist in the Eurasian Economic uh, Union. The tendency of regional isola isolation and the tendency of together go into to globalization. As far as I understand, for most of the participants of the Eurasian Economic Union, for sure for Kazakhstan, uh, <coughs> but also for Belarus. Maybe for Belarus, this, uh, this regional uh, isolationalistic component is quite important because their industries are not very competitive uh, and, they, and they mostly need a uh, Russian market. But for Kazakhstan, for sure, the more preferable uh, future of the Eurasian Economic Union is the future of it becoming part of globalization, not an isolated, uh, self-sufficient uh, self -sufficient block. <coughs> and <coughs> that is partly connected to your question, what is the, the economic policy? Um, I think that the economic policy is uh, to, you are right to some extent that uh, Russia uh, wants to, to push countries into, into this economic bloc. But I don't think that there is much political thinking about it. Russia just wants to, big, to build a big enough player for the, global, uh, for the global economics. Because alone, even Russia is not a very big economic, uh, economic player. I uh, figuratively call it, or label it as the policy of mergers and acquisitions. So the stake is not that much on the organic growth right now, but on mergers and acquisitions, on trying to assemble something big enough so that it is globally, uh, globally important from economic perspective. Because from political perspective, we are definitely <laughs> globally important. 
with nuclear weapons, with uh, more conventional power, with conventional outreach to, uh, to the Middle East and, and other pl uh, places. Definitely Russia is a, a global political player, no question about it. But the ambition is, actually it's not an ambition, it is the understanding that you need also to be a global economic, uh, economic player. Uh, to reach that through organic growth, that may take too long mm. and, and never be possible. Uh, that's why when organic growth is not, uh, is not fast enough, what business is doing? Mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> Uh, but not for the sake of isolation, but for the sake of becoming a, a good and big enough uh, global, <coughs> global player. Um, and I think that Russia is, is ready to put aside a lot of political issues for the sake of, uh, uh, of reaching this goal of making a big economic uh, a big economic uh, player. <clears throat> the question of the, 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 the important question is whether Russia is pushing uh, countries to, uh, to this block. And that is connected to, uh, to, to, to a few comments which, uh, which were uh, on the floor whether Russian interest is, is really downgrading. Mm -hmm. I think that Russia was a very active uh, in, 2000, in, in, in 2014, 15. And you can say, in particular in the case of Armenia, that that was pushing. Because uh, Armenia is, is, a is a good example when the country was actually prepared to do something very different, to sign agreement with the European Union, mm -hmm. <coughs> a cessation agreement. However, after high-level meetings, decided to join uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. So you can call it push, and I cannot agree with the terms like blackmail or this being done with the gun to uh, to the head. I do not agree with these interpretations, but I agree with the term uh, pushing. There was pushing. <coughs> that pushing was the consequence of the quest for building the block quickly. But I think that after the realization came that the Ukrainian crisis is going to last long, it's, no, it's not going to be fixed quickly. Um, and Ukraine is not going to be part of this integration process anytime soon, <coughs> the, uh, the rush somehow uh, downsized. Russia, I think it was very important uh, <coughs> in the beginning of this decade to make the block really quickly, but to make it quickly big enough the job appeared to be unfinished and probably un unfeasible in the near future. And from this uh, perspective, I think that Russia took a sort of pause. Okay, we are not pushing anymore for building it quickly. Let us just manage smartly what we already have. Others, let them have negotiations, like for example, Tajikistan has economic consultations with the Eurasian Economic Union to join, not to join, but there is no political push uh, for Tajikistan to, to join. I think that Russia <coughs> is not Russian anymore for building that block quickly. Um, and that's what I mean when I say that the interest uh, downgraded to, to some and extent. And you're also, you're answering the question, you're saying it's not consistent, that there, <coughs> there is a shift, and the shift is towards a pragmatism towards a certain goal, right? So uh, yeah, the, 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 sh it's, it's, um, the shift to proving that what we already established may work, may work to, to the benefit of all, uh, of all participant countries, because there are many complaints in Kazakhstan, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, about uh, the operations of the Eurasian Economic Union. 
So it's, it's, it's very important to make it a story of, uh, of success. Maybe the bigger mission of making a global economic player is put a little bit aside uh, to reach better operational work of, uh, of what already uh, established. But I think that the, the bigger mission is, is not abandoned. It is just put on hold because <coughs> the political realities are, are too tough, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the, the Ukrainian crisis. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we need to, to live through that, and if in a few years the Ukrainian crisis is somehow uh, losing uh, the, the tension, and if by that time we see that the Eurasian Economic Union is the story of success, I think that the mission of building a, a bigger economic block will be, will be renewed. All right. Did it answer all, all I don't know how to, how to question Oh, the, the last one uh, of interest and, uh, uh, and influence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the Chinese example is a little bit confusing because definitely <coughs> China spends a lot of money in Central Asia, also in the Caucasus and in Eastern Europe. However, does it equal to have an interest in these regions? You, uh, China has interest in maintaining globalization. Uh, it was declared, uh, I, I remember seven years ago uh, when uh, Russia started uh, as, I, uh, says, as I've just said, to think more in regional terms. We traveled <coughs> in 2010 uh, to Beijing and discussed these regionalization tendencies with many Chinese experts, and they, they didn't buy Russian logic that time at all. They were saying, we need globalization, we need globalization, we need globalization, and we believe that the United States will continue yeah. <laughs> all the globalization. Then they found out that the United States may, may change <laughs> its, its mind or make or politicize uh, economic globalization. And uh, this year, she declared in, in Davos that they are the, the knights of globalization. They, are the of globalization. they will make yeah. everything globalization to continue. <clears throat> and the Silk, Pro uh, Silk Road project is about globalization, about keeping the lines of globalization open. And that's why they are building global infrastructure <laughs> to maintain, to, to give new momentum to, to globalization, to keep China uh, plugged to all yeah. important regions of the global de development. And from this perspective, Central Asia, Caucasus, even Russia, <laughs> are just uh, territories they need to, to transit. But Russia is a hub. Russia, you know, <coughs> this is the thing. If you look at some of these maps, you know, what's Some parts of Russia are hubs. Moscow is a hub. Moscow, Kazan, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, that Volga region, uh, Molga, Volga region right. and, and Moscow, that may be uh, the hub. But, well, maybe some <laughs> sub-hubs also in, uh, in Central Asia. Right. But still, mostly these are areas of, uh, of transit. That's why spending, of mo spending money in these transit areas, I would not equalize to, to the interest in, this, uh, in these regions. Though it depends how it evolves, right? It's, you, you can see a model <coughs> where once you've spent enough money and built enough, in, this, this will evolve. Then you need right? to defend it. Then you, yeah, you might. Yeah, right? you, you might need to defend it, and then your interest may, uh, may, may grow. But that will be the uh, consequence of how things evolve rather than the, 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 the aspiration and the real interest. Right. So I think they would like to build infrastructure and and, and not to defend it, <laughs> not, not to add interest to, to these yeah. regions. All right, uh, are there more questions, comments, or early questions? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Manish Mamadnaviva, I'm Rumsfeld Fellow. So one question about this Eurasian Union, yes. Uh, so it's clear that it's a matter of timing that Central Asia countries will join this. Like I can say about Tajikistan, because I'm from Tajikistan. 
uh, because even if there is no political pressure, but we are economically dependent on, the co <coughs> on Russia. So, and it's a matter of timing, I think. <coughs> but the question is about, do you think that when Russia will complete this Eurasian Union within the Central Asia, will Russia move to, like, is there a possibility that they will move to Afghanistan? Let's say that Afghanistan will be included to Eurasian Union, or maybe then China. So do you consider it, consider it as a threat or as a possibility? <coughs> and what would you think about the United States role on this? Like, maybe it's a time for creating a new platform? <laughs> because again, the question about like, you see, historically, we, 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 was, we dependent on Russia, yes? Because all, all our trading routes with Russia. And we <coughs> never consider the South-South cooperation. So it seems that there is a potential for this. But again, it's now uh, the, uh, the issue is like, not the issue, but the question of who will be the first in developing of this platform. Uh, <coughs> when the one, one of the uh, lessons from the European integration is that the success of integration is measured uh, by how free is the move of goods, people, capital, and so on. So the metric of integration is how you take away barriers uh, for participating countries. However, U European Union over time was finding out that <coughs> to take borders inside, whatever borders, economic, customs, or state borders, or uh, sanitary borders, and, and so on. So to take borders, to take away borders inside, you need to strengthen the outside common border. Uh, it, it became particularly <coughs> clear with the problem of uh, migration, not even during this migration crisis, but already in the 90s. Uh, already in the end of the, uh, of the 80s and uh, in the early 90s. So when you eliminate borders inside your union, you, you should strengthen your outside borders. And then it becomes very important to understand where are these outside borders and not to have loopholes in these outside borders. Um, I think that the Eurasian Economic Union understands this lesson very well, but cannot decide <laughs> Where should be this? Uh, where should where should the perimeter be closed? <laughs> where where are the uh, the limits of these outside borders? Not only politically uh, advisable uh, limits, but also the limits which can be technically managed. Uh, because as soon as you take Afghanistan, uh, you have a huge loophole. For example, I, I usually say that why Kyrgyzstan was important for the, Eurasian, for the customs union first and then for, for the Eurasian Economic Union. Because it is an element of the border of this union with, uh, with China. Um, Kyrgyzstan itself is not that big asset for the Eurasian Economic <coughs> Union, but it is an important element to close, uh, well, to, to have a, a good border of the economic union with, uh, with China. Because we may have whatever union with, with Kazakhstan, but with Kyrgyzstan not participated, our union has an open border actually to, uh, to China. That's why it's very important to be smart and to balance your ambitions against the reality. Uh, what are manageable borders of your economic, uh, economic union? And I th my personal view is that anything beyond Tajikistan is, uh, is unmanageable. Even with Tajikistan, it is a very big, uh, a big issue because Tajikistan has important trade routes uh, to the south which were established in, uh, through, the last, uh, through the last decade. Uh, there is intensive trade <coughs> through Afghanistan with uh, Pakistani Punjab. 
uh, with agriculture products and with some construction materials. Um, and many countries, and, and that was also the Kyrgyz experience, like they say, we want to be in, but also to have the border open. <laughs> uh, that is not going to happen. That's also what Ukraine wanted. <laughs> They want it to be both <laughs> with the European Union in, associ in association and with more or less open uh, economic borders, and also to have open economic borders with, uh, with customs union and, uh, and emergent, that time still under negotiations, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and all that was uh, conceptualized like we are a bridge between you so that you do not have closed borders, we, we a bridge. But economic unions are established to have borders, economic borders, within which borders are taken away. That's why bridges are not that much, uh, that much needed. And for Tajikistan, it will be, a, I understand for Tajikistan, it will be very, very difficult uh, decision because management of the border with China and with Afghanistan will have to be substantially, uh, substantially changed. I do not mean the security part of the border, I mean the, the economic management of, uh, of the border. And then, of course, Tajikistan will, uh, will decide somehow what is more important, <laughs> to have an uh, open border to Kyrgyzstan and, and then to Kazakhstan and Russia, or to, to have a uh, uh, more open border to, uh, to the south. But I think Afghanistan is, is out of question. Although inside Russia there are people who are arguing for extending economic uh, interest uh, into, that, into that region. Uh, I'm not part of that argument. <laughs> okay, I think that's all the time we have. Um, I would like uh, to thank Ivan. I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Ivan for a really interesting presentation which has sparked a great discussion. I'm looking forward to seeing what this turns into as uh, we pull it together and write it up. And I'd like to also thank all of you for joining in and for asking such excellent questions. So thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks.